Today, uh, we're looking at we're looking at the church, as in our local church. What it looks like to belong in a local church community, and to do so, we're going to be looking at Paul's letter to the Philippians, uh, just in the first chapter. Basically, just his introduction, where we get this painting this picture painted of what it'll look like to belong in the church in Philippi. So let me read it for you, we'll pray, we'll get stuck into it, and we'll look at what does it look like for us to be a church, be a community that belongs to Jesus, that reflects the love and the light of Christ. So let me read for you. Paul and Timothy, so it's Paul and actually Timothy writing this letter, servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and the deacons, grace to you and peace, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It's right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace both in my imprisonment and in the defence and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. And it's my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. Let's pray. And so, Father, we want to thank you for these scriptures. Thank you for for Paul and Timothy who wrote it. I want to thank you for your Holy Spirit who inspired it and still speaks to us today. And so, Father, I'm, I'm again asking for open hearts and minds, soft spirits to your Holy Spirit. As we read and listen to and think about these words. Please help us to gain the mind of Christ. Please help us to understand you more, more of your character, more of your goodness, more of your holiness, more of your love like we see featured here. And Father, we would be doers of your word and not only hearers. And so, Lord, help help us so that your word has its full effect on us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is like, this is like Paul's intro to, to a letter. We're not going to go into the letter too much today. We really want to have a, a look at the snapshot of his opening. But he finishes with a point. He finishes to the glory and praise of God. It's the purpose of Paul's writing. It's the purpose of Paul's life. It's the purpose of his, his everything. Paul says, it's all about the glory of God. That's why I'm writing to you. That's why everything that I've said is important. Everything that's to follow is all about the glory of God. It's one of the key themes of his letter. No matter what life brings, Paul's goal is the glory of God in his life and in the world. That's his goal. That's his end. That's his joy. That's his purpose. That's his work. And so he finishes, even though he writes with great affection, with great love to these people. He says, you've been partners with me in the gospel from the very beginning. I love you guys. Every time I think about you, I'm full of joy and thankfulness to God. He says, and the purpose of it all is that he would get glory. We looked at this a little bit last week that we are far too easily satisfied as human beings. That we were made to be satisfied with the glory of God actually develop, we're, we're built that way, we're designed that way, that we would be fulfilled or we would be most satisfied as God is most glorified in us and God is most glorified in us as we are most satisfied in Him. And so Paul, again, is pointing to this, the ultimate in satisfaction. In fact, the only satisfaction, which is the glory of God. And writes to all the saints, to every believer. So although he's writing to a specific church in a particular time, in a particular geographic region uh, in Philippi, he's writing to all the saints as well, which is why we still see this letter in our scriptures today. He's writing to you and to me. When he says to all the saints, he's not just talking about a select few, but some 
in some denominations hold up as venerated or as particularly holy or as particularly worthy of thought, but to everybody who belongs to Jesus. And so for you, you might, you might have even said the words, oh, you know, I'm no saint, but something, something, something. But in fact, if you're in Christ, you are a saint. That's what, it, that's what Paul is writing here. So he's writing to you and to me, even as he's writing to these people. I mean, he's specifically writing to these people, but it's writing also for us. And he goes on and he says, my prayer with joy. And so Paul, man, this word joy uh, is throughout Philippians. And if you know Philippians, there's a lot of struggle in Philippians. Uh, There's a lot of suffering in Philippians. Even Paul talks about Jesus going to the cross and calls it the joy set before him in the same letter. And so Paul is, from the beginning, reorienting his reader and our understanding of what joy is. Joy is not based in circumstance because we see throughout this letter, Paul even says, I've learned in every circumstance I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So he's not saying your joy is determined on your circumstance. He's saying our joy is wrapped up in, again, the glory of God. He says, from the first day, from when I first met you, here this church in Philippi, um, you know, small history to help us understand where we're going today. Uh, Paul did a bunch of missionary journeys, went and preached the gospel, established churches, like planted churches. Um, On his second missionary journey, he lands in Philippi, meets some people, and meets someone called Lydia, who is a businesswoman. She opens up her home and actually the church is planted in her house, in Lydia's house. It's really wonderful. There's a jailer, known as the Philippian jailer because he's a jailer and he's in Philippi. He's a Philippian uh, who becomes a Christian. <clears throat> he is about to kill himself because of, of really bad circumstances. He's a jailer and it looks like all of the people have escaped and Paul says, oh, we're still here, mate. And the jailer says, what do I have to do to be saved? And Paul helps him understand salvation is in Jesus. These are the ones that he is writing to. He's writing to these people who he knows and who he loves, who have been partners with him in the gospel from the very beginning. Lydia comes to know Jesus, opens up her house, becomes like a, a matriarch even in the church. And these are the people Paul's writing to and says, man, I, every time I think about you, I just... I bubble up, I well up with joy and thankfulness because of their partnership in the gospel from the first day. They'd been in each other's homes, they'd sung together, they'd eaten together, they'd lived together, they've worked together, they've loved together, they've shared the Lord's Supper together, they've prayed together, they've borne one another's burdens together, they've been on mission together. These people are partners in the gospel with Paul. And so Paul's saying, the work that I'm doing, you've shared in that work. We're partners, we're co-laborers, we're co-heirs. We are arm in arm doing the work of God together. It's wonderful, it's beautiful, actually. And again, written to the Philippians, written for us, we are sharing in the work as well. Doing the same kinds of work where we meet in one another's homes, where we eat together, and love together and bear one another's burdens and pray together. We love together and we are on mission together. We're planting churches together, Lord willing, in two months, we're going to plant another church together, uh, a seventh church uh, in God's goodness and kindness. And Paul says, you are partners with me. We are a church together. We're doing it together. And so they, li- they also might have kind of held up Paul like, wow, Paul, he, he is this kind of, Let's put him on a pedestal. We tend to do this with Paul. We're like, wow, Paul, he was the dude, man. Be here in some of Paul's other letters, and we'll hear this with the Corinthians as well. Paul writes to them and he's like, I know you don't think much of me. I know when, I can't, you know, when I'm there with you, I'm, I've softly spoken. And when I'm away from you, I write harshly. And so you think I'm weak-willed. So let me, let me show you how weak-willed I am when I come again. You know, but we kind of put him up on a, on a pedestal with people in his day didn't, except for the ones who were partners with him. But he wasn't otherly. He was there with them, arm in arm, in their homes, they in his. 
on mission together, loving together. And he said, and from the beginning you did this, and even now I'm away, you are still partners in the gospel. You're still doing the work. You're still bearing one another's burdens. You're still being the church of Jesus. It's wonderful, he says. He says, this is why I, every time I think of you, even though I'm far away now, I am so filled with joy and thankfulness. And he says this, verse 6, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So Jesus had begun a work in them through Paul and, and Timothy, certainly by the Holy Spirit, the power of the gospel, and that work was continuing in this church, even though Paul was no longer there. And Paul says, man, the, the thing that God is doing in you and among you, I am so confident he's going to bring that to completion when Jesus comes again. It's no wonder that Paul says of these people, and here's the key, I think, for us. How do we learn about what does it look like for us to be a community of Jesus here in Adelaide in 2024? This is what he says. He says, I hold you in my heart. I think this is a like this is a wonderful and beautiful thing. Again, for someone who has suffered alongside people who has weeped when they have been weeping and has celebrated when they were celebrating, who's worshipped their King Jesus together, been on mission together, faced hardships and persecutions together, he says to the man, I hold you in my heart. Where, what's closer? than the seat and the sum of, of a person, than their heart. Paul has deep love and affection for his people. He saw many of them come to faith. Not only that, but to grow in faith and then themselves open up their homes, open up their lives, become disciple makers, to see them become spiritual mothers and fathers. He's done life with them and we emulate this kind of life on life in our discipleship groups and in our church together as well. There's actually one of the key goals for us as a community. It's one of the reasons that we do, we have very little in the way of programs, very little in the way of um, like flashy things. We try to do things well, obviously. Um, but what we want to do is maximise our holding each other in our hearts. We want to maximise our community. We want to maximise our being in each other's homes, being in each other's lives, eating together, praying together, bearing one another's burdens. That's why Paul writes to the church in Galatia. He says, this is how you fulfil the law of Christ, bear one another's burdens. If we don't have that life on life, we can't bear one another's burdens and then we can't fulfil the law of Christ. Reminds me how he describes the Ephesian church. He's talking about when he leaves the Ephesian church, uh, the, the wording is like a piece of woven fabric being ripped apart. He says, we're like individual strands that have been woven together like a piece of fabric. And now that I'm going on to another missionary journey, uh, it's like our, li our lives have been so closely intertwined as we've lived together and loved together and been the church together, that now that we're separating, it's like a ripping of cloth. It's painful and it's, it's messy edges. And you, you see even when he leaves the church in Ephesus, everyone's bawling their eyes crying because they held each other in their hearts. They loved one another deeply. It wasn't, they weren't church attenders where church was something abstract of themselves. Church isn't an institution. Church is not a location. The church is a gathering of the sent ones. And it's people who hold each other in the heart. And I wonder, who do you hold in your heart? Is that a ring circled only around yourself and your own life? Or just around your immediate family? Is a ring only around people who are like you or who make your life easy? I wonder, like Paul, if you hold on your heart people who aren't like you, your brothers and your sisters. And that's one of the things I love about the church. It's one of the things the church was known for, actually, in the early days. People would write about these, these strange Christians. How is it 
The men and the women worship together. The rich and the poor worship together. The slave and the free hold, hold hands, shoulder to shoulder. Bear one another's burdens, do their work. How is it they share their tables, but not their beds? They loved each other. They held one another in their hearts. Hearts already full of the love of God have lots of room for brothers and sisters. And for us, we, we fill our lives, we tend to, in Australia in 2024, we tend to fill our lives so full. Not only do we not have margin, even for ourselves, which I think is one of the reasons that like, our mental health is so bad, but that's for another sermon. One of the reasons. But we've crowded out any space in our heart for other people. And so you might be hearing this sermon and, and, and hearing it as a, you should do this, or you ought to do that. I might be feeling, oh man, this is, you're heaping more into my already over full life. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm actually making the case that we need to do the work of taking things off of our already full life to make room in our hearts for brothers and sisters. And not just the ones we already know. Here's the problem. <clears throat> for us at City Light right now, uh, our discipleship groups, like again, the, the, the core unit of our church are our discipleship groups. So we do most effectively all these things. We can't, in, in a church of many hundreds of people, do this kind of bearing one another's burdens. We can't say, hey, everyone come around to my place after church and let's have lunch together. Literally could not fit in a house. Do you understand what I mean? We need those smaller communities to have the deepest belonging we see hearts and homes open to the people who we have here. Again, our discipleship groups already full. We need more discipleship groups, let alone the people that God seems to be bringing in who don't know Jesus, who do know Jesus and need a home, people who are far from him or, or have wandered away and God is welcoming them back, inviting them back, drawing them closer to him again. We need more open hearts and open homes. And he even says here, <clears throat> he holds them in his heart with the affection of Christ Jesus. So just like Jesus commanded in John 13, 34, 35, says, a new commandment I give to you, you must love one another. That's the commandment, you must love one another. Then he qualifies it and he says, just as I have loved you, you must love one another. So when Paul says, I hold you in my heart with the affection of Jesus. He does it in obedience to the command of our King, that we love one another with the same love with which He's loved us. The same love. At Cedar Light, that means our goal as a church community is not that we would grow a Sunday service. We don't even call these meetings services. We call them gatherings because it's the gathering of the church together. So to grow these gatherings... It's not to have like amazing, you know, sound and, and light show and uh, slick production. Although again, we want to do things really, really well. Our goal is that every heart has a home. And God is, to our shame, God is doing our work for us. In that we've had many people over the last year who have, without someone saying to them, or inviting them to church. Hey, you should, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me share with you about the love of Christ. Although that has happened, and so that's amazing. We've also had many people in the double digits who have just, from the Holy Spirit beckoning them, who've walked through the doors of our church community. And uh, in saying, hey, you know, what brought you along today? People said, oh, I don't know. I've never, been, I've had this conversation maybe a dozen times this last year. I've never been to church before in my life. Not for a wedding, not for a funeral, but I walked past and, I, and something stirred within me. Or I lived down the road, I was, uh, I was watching TV, something stirred within me. Just got out of prison, don't want to go back, Googled, how do, you know, what, uh, what do I need to do basically to, to be saved, essentially. Uh, see the light, church comes up, et cetera, et cetera, over and over and over again. That's our job, actually. Our job is to be uh, salt and light in the world, 
to be that prophetic city on a hill whose light can't be hidden, the lamp, the lamp or the lampstand that gives light to all in the house, that we would be the ones actually going out and putting on display for a watching world. Like John 13, 35, he finishes, Jesus finishes by saying, by this, all people will know that you're my disciples. By this, everyone will know that you belong to me if you love one another. And so what we're going to do is be a community that loves one another, not hidden away, but on display for all to see. So that we can say, hey, come, every heart has a home. Every heart a home here at City Light. Come and belong. Come and know Jesus who loves you and has saved you. We, we fail this. Um, we fail at this, but this is our goal. If you feel like you've been failed in this area, uh, please forgive us. Uh, please persevere with us because this is our goal, every heart of home. That you belong here, you grow here, you'd meet Jesus here, become more like Jesus here, have opportunities to invest into other people and disciple other people so that they too might become more like Jesus here. I mean, I, I, on the positive side, I, I, as one of the elders here, I'm in a privileged position to get to hear every week of stories where this is happening in our church community. Every week where burdens are getting born. Every week where people are being looked after. Every week where people are sharing meals. People are sharing Jesus. People are praying for one another. People are growing up in the likeness of Jesus. Every week I hear stories of this happening. Here at City Light, every heart has a home. There are discipleship groups here that exist to bear your burdens and they exist so that you can help bear burdens. They exist so that you can pray together. So you can live life on life and weave your life, the thread of your life, into the threads of others and become, a, again, like a strong fabric knit together in love. You need to eat together, do mission together, study scriptures together, become like Jesus together. You've got a discipleship group leader who loves you and prays for you. You have elders and ministry leaders who love you and who pray for you. This is, this is our hope and our goal together. We would obey Jesus' command to love one another, that you would be held in someone's heart and that you would hold people in your heart. That's our goal. And it says, why? It says, so that your love may abound more and more. He wants for these things. He hopes for these things. He prays for these things for the church in Philippi, for us, so that we might abound more and more in love. So that the thing that we are pursuing, we would do and do to the ever-increasing uh, until we attain to the perfection of Jesus. That's the, that's the termination. When we get there, oh, we could just stay there. And so, so that your love may abound more and more, so that, so there's another so that, so that we would grow, so that we may approve what is excellent, so that we might be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, so that we might be filled, verse 11, with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus. So God does want us to grow, to grow into the likeness of Jesus, so that we would think more like him, so that we would love more like him, so that we would relate more like him to the Father and to each other. It's our goal. So we would grow. And so what we're going to see as a community is we're not a community that just says, well, <clears throat> we love you and stay exactly as you are. You're perfect. We're not that community. We're the community that says, we love you. Come and belong. We want to hold you in our heart. But we also want you to hold us in your heart. We want to point each other towards Jesus. We want to deal with our sin. We want to become more like him. We want to suffer well together, not to avoid the struggle, but to grow in the struggle. And then again, back where we finished at the end, to the glory and praise of God. So my, my question is, what would it look like if we started to live like this? And I, I know already many of you do live like this. this is, it, and we have wonderful... Uh, like again, in our discipleship groups, many of our discipleship groups are living this out. And it's wonderful. And God does get the glory as you do it, as we live like this. What would it look like if, if we all live like this? We had hearts, we, 
we did the work of creating not just margin in our lives, but room in our lives for brothers and sisters, for one another, to fulfil the law of Christ, to be obedient to his command to love one another. So we could be like Paul. Whenever we think of those people, we well up with joy and and thanksgiving and praise to God. We would pray for them whenever we think about them. And how would you like to be in a community where when somebody thought about you, they well up with joy? When someone thinks about you, they can't help but to thank God. Oh, I thank God for that person. That someone's there to bear your burdens. That someone's there that you hold in your heart so lovingly that you want to bear their burdens. They're not a burden to you in the sense of something that you don't want to do. They're a burden to you in the sense of something that you do, you want to run to, to help them. That's the kind of community God is building here. I really believe that is why God has graced us in being able to start six communities like this and Lord willing soon as seventh is because we, we are that city on a hill. That's why we call the church City Light, actually, was because we wanted to be that, that city light. We wanted to live that out. We wanted to be that kind of community. What would it look like? What impact would it have on our own lives? What impact would it have on our relationship with God? What impact would it have on our on the kingdom in Adelaide? What would be our impact in the world? These are things that I think are not just worth our considering. Uh, they, in a sense, demand our consideration. Our King has commanded us to love one another with the same love he has for us. How are we doing? Let's pray together. And so, Father, I want to thank you for these scriptures. Thank you for this call and command to love, but also the example to lo- of love that we have in Jesus, an example of what it looks like in a church community uh, here in Philippi as we um, are in your scriptures. So Father, help us to love like Jesus loves us. We want to hold one another in our hearts, weaving the fabric of our lives together. Uh, we, Father, I just acknowledge we won't do this in our own strengths or in our own mind, but we need the mind of Christ. And so help us. We want to bring you glory with our lives, with our words, with our love. And so please help us. May your love be tangible among us so that all people can see that we belong to you. Help us to open our hearts, open our lives, open our homes to one another. For that, again, as we get in the mind of Christ, help, may that be our goal in life, not the things that we have been chasing, although good, but that we would chase that thing that comes from you. And help us to love people well that every heart would have a home. There there wouldn't be people who are on the edges or on the outer, but that in every way would be a community that reflects the love of Jesus, that brings you glory, that sees many daughters and sons come to know you, grow in you, experience the freedom of being in Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name for his sake.